Porosity. Bug holes. Worm holes. Pinholes. There's actually a lot of names for this stuff, and that's what today is all about. Now I'm sure a lot of you like myself are aware of what porosity is. If you don't know, it's a cavity type discontinuity caused by the trapped gases during the solidification of the weld. It's something that happens in any welding process. Typically some sort of atmospheric gases coming in because of lack of shielding or breezes or leaks or trash or something is just not right and we're trapping some other gas that we don't need to be inside that weld because that weld needs to be all solid metal and it forms those pores. These could be as little as one tiny one or it could be all over the place. It really just depends and knowing what type of porosity you have and that's right there are different types of porosity will help you find out what the problem is while you're going about welding. One of our forms is scattered porosity. Just like it sounds, it's pretty much just any type of hole, different shapes, sizes, all over the place. We don't really have any consistencies in it. Then you'll have what's called linear porosity. These holes can be in varying sizes, but they're typically in a straight line. Maybe they're higher, maybe they're lower, and then we'll have something like uniform porosity. I think it's a little bit of a funny term for porosity because it really still kind of looks a lot like scattered, but it's a little bit closer together. There's a little bit more of a specific reason why this is happening. And same thing with cluster porosity. You'll just have just a pocket of a mess. Similar occurrences here in uniform and cluster, it's usually a pretty specific instance that's giving you that problem. Then we have our wormhole porosity. This is a hole that usually has a long length to it. There might be several. Some of them are just to the surface. Some of them do dive deeper. And that brings us to our crater. I haven't seen a whole lot more of crater porosity. What they're calling crater porosity is the fact that the crater solidifies and it's low, it's concave. The biggest thing to know about porosity is they're kind of like cockroaches. You have your surface porosity and even your subsurface porosity. You might not see a pinhole on the top, doesn't mean that they can't be in there. And typically if you see one on the surface, you get to digging, you're gonna find a lot more. And that's why I consider them kind of like cockroaches. The bad thing about porosity is it's gonna end up weakening your weld. It's gonna let it be a little bit more susceptible to corrosion to the worst case scenario where it's just gonna collapse in on itself because it's nothing but air pockets and not a solid well. But now that we know a little bit more about porosity, let's go over to our experiment for the day where we're gonna try to get all these different types and how to avoid them, or at least how I know all the different types of ways to get porosity and how I avoid them. For today's experiment, we've got our big piece of plate here. I've already put a root in it from our last video on how to repair a MIG root. If you haven't seen that one already, go back to that other video and go check it out. We're gonna use the Hurricane MTS-C today. I think it's a good machine to use today because I am gonna use multiple processes, maybe just three or so, in order to accomplish the different porosities that I'm gonna try to get. And this is a multi-process machine, everything across the board, MIG, TIG, stick, AC, DC. And guys, if you don't know, you've heard already about Cayman welding gloves, because I talk about them all the time. The 1600s are my go-tos. They're actually running a promo right now on their Amazon store. They are our partners, but we're not getting anything off these sales. You go down, use the code down below in our description for this month that they're running it, you can get a good deal on gloves. Not only that, but you can use our other codes in our description for our other partners like Everlast and Outlaw Leather. You can get upgraded foot pedals and TIG torch with your purchase of a machine, or you can get a nice discount on a welding hood. Now that we got that, we're gonna start with MIG today. We're gonna go with C25, our gas, and we'll just go ahead and set our voltage. Now, as far as voltage and wire feed, not always gonna be the issues with your porosity. Not to say that that couldn't be an issue later on the road, though. For what we're doing today, it's never, it's not gonna be a voltage problem. 19 and 250, that's whale. Make some nasty whales. All right, we'll start with some easy ones, all right? What's almost always gonna get you porosity is whenever you weld a process that needs shielding gas. Uh, TIG, MIG, flux core, dual shield, you're gonna end up needing shielding gas. So I didn't turn my gas on at all. Porosity, every time. This being no gas, there's porosity absolutely everywhere, and that's gonna be scattered porosity, if you wanna give it a name. And we should be running around 20 CFH. Now let's see if, I'm gonna open this wide open. So that's gonna be all the gas I could pull out of that regulator. Let's see if that gives me any issues. That gas is definitely on now, we got that that ball on that meter all the way to the top. Let's see if that gives us any issues. I would say that there's no porosity in that weld, but we blasted the gas on that. I don't think with these low flow regulators, you're gonna have any problems if you have too much. The biggest issue is you're just using more gas than you need. So how little of gas 
do we need to not get porosity? Let's do like, it's like 10, uh, 12, 13. Let's try that. All right, so we're like at 13 CFH. I don't want my fan over here to get me in any trouble. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off off. Anytime we're working at a lower CFH, at any breeze is gonna definitely push that away. If you have a breeze and you still have to weld, you have a few options. You can hoot yourself in, find a windbreak, block the wind, or turn the gas up and see if that helps. Even at 13, man, we're still getting no porosity. Now let's see about turning the fan back on. Full beans. Now mind you, that fan's still I don't know, 12 feet away or so. I'm just trying to see what I can get away with. Oh, yep, sure enough. I can bury my nozzle and get a lot closer and be okay, but if I take that contact to work distance out to something normal like 3 8 there's definitely porosity in that weld. I bet there's underbead. Oh yeah. Some good evidence right here of some maybe crater porosity or cluster porosity. The breeze is coming by and knocking it away or we're moving too far away with our contact to work distance. The first thing I would do is either turn that fan off or go see if my gas bottle is either low or getting close to empty or I can turn my gas up. Now we're gonna go ahead and test this cockroach theory of mine, right? We've got porosity here and here. Let's see if there's anything in between. Right now I don't see anything. Well, lucky for us, we didn't have any porosity in between, but I still want to bring y'all in for a closer look to show you that this is still not fixed yet. I got to kind of play with the camera focus here so you can see this, but right here at the end of it, we've got to grind all this porosity out, essentially. That's, that's how you fix it. And it goes a little bit deeper than you probably like it to. This one's kind of clear. We can see this really easily that we got to get rid of still. But back here, right in this area, that was that other cluster porosity towards the front. It's still not ground out completely. There's still a speck there, 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 there. That all has to go before we can weld over top of it. Otherwise, we're just trapping it underneath. Now, depending on what welding code you're working to, or if you're working to any code at all, will depend on the amount of porosity that's allowed in. Believe it or not, being that porosity are the shape of circles, there are no stress risers per se, compared to something like a, we'll just call this a crack or a slag inclusion, where we got pointy bits, pointy edges, sharp edges, easier things for metal to tear at, where porosity is round, and believe it or not, those round things are harder to tear. Permissibly, there's usually a little bit more of a lenience to porosity. Now, I'm not saying, again, that some codes are gonna say you can't have any, but there are gonna be some codes that'll say they have to be a certain size, a certain spacing, a certain depth in order to pass. I wanna get y'all a better visual on how small this porosity can be. It looked good from grinding there, but I can still see from a trained eye, there's still some specs. I want y'all to be able to see that too. So we'll spray our cleaner on, and then we'll spray our developer on. We're gonna have to let this dwell for roughly 10 minutes is, is what they say. So we'll wipe it off, and then we'll spray our developer on. Now that the penetrant has had enough time to kind of seep in there and penetrate, we're gonna spray some cleaner on a rag and get all this excess off. Porosity doesn't mean that it's always on plate. I know that I'm doing it on plate right now, but that's not always gonna be the case. So you could be an auto body tech, you could be a structural welder, you could be a pipe welder. Porosity is porosity in all ways, shape and form. And if you really wanna get more in the technical side of stuff and you're in high school and you wanna develop more of your skills, reach out to your instructor to see how you can get involved with something like Skills USA. That's what I did when I was in high school and in, even in college. Getting involved with Skills USA really helped me hone in my skills on the technical aspects of what welding really is. And it was a really nice thing to keep competing too, because you got to see where you were at. It was cool to go to state. I almost made it to nationals, but because I didn't follow the technical steps needed, I didn't make it. And those are the technical steps that transfer over into the real world. Anyway, the penetrates on there. Now we can go ahead and spray on the developer. Might take a second or two to get them to pop. Once they're popped up to the surface, then we'll be able to see them. So I ended up grinding out more than I thought I actually did and kind of found a bigger problem. I guess from whenever I showed you guys how to fix a repair on a root, I didn't fix it too good. I've got lack of fusion all on this bottom side and that's what that die penetrate did is it showed it. I see this lack of fusion all the way up and even a crack running into the porosity that's right here that we didn't grind out. There are some little bits of porosity right in here 
and a little bit right there. Now they're not very easy to see because either I didn't do the dwell time long enough or they were just really shallow. They're still there nonetheless and we even were able to see some other stuff with the NDT process. I always keep some dye pen in the shot because it's just very handy to really see clear as day where some of the problems are. So we get it. MIG welding, you can get porosity. If you don't have your gas on, there's a breeze running, your contact work distance is off. The first thing I'm gonna do if I see any porosity is I'm gonna go check the gas. You wanna check every fitting that that gas line is run to all the way through, all the way to the end of your MIG gun. If I'm getting a pinhole out of nowhere in the middle of a weld or something, the first thing I'm gonna do is look right down the barrel of this guy. This MIG gun right here is gonna have some issues inside this nozzle if you let it get spatter and gunk and all that good stuff. If you let anything fall down that nozzle and it black blocks these little holes in the gas diffuser or just something is blocking this diffuser, you're gonna have porosity. Whether it's down inside this nozzle or it's caked around the ring, you might get enough spatter caked around the ring that it's gonna make it too narrow of a nozzle now and you're gonna have porosity. There's even been times where I've had to swap nozzles to either a narrow one or a wider one depending on the process and the transfer of MIG welding in order to get the proper gas coverage that I needed. I've never had a whole lot of issues inside of a MIG gun, but running back towards the machine, there's a whole nother story. Now when I say machine, I've actually never had any issues with gas on this machine particularly, but the first thing on a machine that I'm gonna check is from the regulator all the way to the gas. Just spray some bubbly water on it. If those are leaking, figure out why. Teflon tape shouldn't be the fix. You shouldn't need any of that stuff but maybe it is, maybe you got some bad threads or maybe you need a new hose. The biggest problem that I always see most students having is when they're going to screw this MIG gun in, if we look closer into this machine, the gas is this little hose right here, right in the front. This is usually the only place of business that you gotta look for. And that's gonna run right into the MIG gun right here. Now, there are some instances where you may not have this pushed in all the way and you got it loose. Some MIG guns aren't like this one, where it's pretty shallow. I can't pull it all the way out because I got wire. But see, this has got like a little narrow, tiny nub on it. Some of them are a lot longer, and you've got to make sure that that pushes in all the way. And you screw this fitting in all the way. This is probably the number one reason why people just get the occasional pinhole. It's because they're not doing this wiggle, this shake, making sure this nut is twisted on all the freaking way. But now that that's all plugged in, now we've got good fittings. You might have even some bad O-rings if it's an older machine. So be checking all those whereabouts. Now we've just switched our machine over to stick. We pulled the MIG gun off. We changed the settings across the top. We've got 125 amps, DC positive, 7018. We're gonna see what we can do as far as getting away with porosity with a 7018 and the easiest way to get porosity with pretty much anything. Now there are kind of two ways to get porosity with the 7018. One, leave your rods out. Let them go bad. It's a low hydrogen rod. It's supposed to stay in an oven or in a sealed container. After it's been opened, it's supposed to stay in an oven. I don't have an oven in my shop and I'm not doing any code work or anything like that. And I use smaller containers. However, the rods can go bad. Different manufacturers make the same rod, but differently and I will say that there is a little bit of a difference in the brand you're using. We're using Lincoln Excalibur right now, the Old Faithfuls. The most common way people get porosity is right there on the start when they're trying to figure out this process. They get lit up, then they just take off. Oops. One way is long arcing it right there on the start like we just did or not chipping that slag good enough off the tip of the electrode trying to use a, a, an older rod and just striking up right on top of what you're doing and going. You really need to strike up in front of the puddle, right? I'll even show you. I'll go ahead and make that <clears throat> plenty messed up. We got a plenty messed up tip, but on this third tie-in, I will not get porosity because I'm gonna let it all fall off and then I'm gonna burn it out. But so far, all we've done is strike up right on top of it and go. Now I'm going to strike up plenty in front of it, burn off the trash, tie in properly, and then move forward. Trash go away, trash go away, tie in. Now there are some nuggets and BBs that I'm going to have to take off. So that was from having to burn off all that trash. You could use a pair of whelpers or something and clip it. That might be a better alternative than trying to just let it rain. But I'll get y'all a closer look. No porosity on this one because I started way over here and burnt all that trash back. This one I started right on top of, I got a lot of porosity. This one I had less flux on the tip of the rod and did the same thing I did here, made it even worse. Starting ahead and coming back will solve all that problem. You will get porosity with a 7018 if you long arc it. Now 7018 is a pretty diggy rod, but WD-40 is some good stuff. We can't weld over that. 
even if we go ahead and try to, we'll just give it a little wipe, just like a haphazard wipe. We'll see if we can get any porosity or if that 7018 will chew through it. I know for a fact MIG will get porosity with that. Well, you can kind of smell it a little, little WD-40 smelling, but I'm not seeing any porosity happening. So that's good. Not to say that that's not going to hurt your weld. Let's see if we see any. No, I don't see any. This time we won't give it a wipe. Ooh. You can see that stuff burns off pretty easy, I guess. That looks pretty, pretty oily to me. That's definitely trouble city for MIG welding. You'll never get through that much oil with MIG. You're just gonna pick up nothing but porosity. But that WD-40 doesn't seem to be being a huge issue for us with this 7018. I don't recommend it, but just make sure you're removing all of that oil and grease if you can. One thing that should give us some better results, a little spray paint. <laughs> no way, no way we don't get a pinhole. And I'll be dipped. Maybe that paint needs to dry a little bit or something. But that's one reason why I do love a 7018. That sucker will eat. I mean, granted, this isn't like thick paint. I was just like a little squirt with a rattle can, but we're weld welding over stuff we're not supposed to be. And it's welding. With any porosity, let's see. Not a single pinhole. That's good. That's great. I mean, that's what you want right there. And that's going to come with a quality welding electrode and running it hot. Now, when it comes to oil and paint, you want to clean it all. Point blank period, you want to clean it all because you can have underlying surfaces like incomplete fusion, like that maybe did, because of those oil paints. Even no scale can do that. Now, there's one more form of porosity that you can get, or one more way you can get porosity that I can still show you today. We're going to dive into it. All right, so I swapped over rigs, and the biggest reason is this is my dual shield flux core machine. If you know anything about flux cores, kind of like stick in the sense that if the wire goes bad or you don't store it properly or it gets moisture inside of it. In this case, it's still low hydrogen type wire. It can go bad. This wire I bought, I did one video with and I never used it again. And I set it in the corner. I thought I haphazardly bagged it and wrapped it and kept it from absorbing any moisture. But dude, here in Houston, it, it's humid and it got into it. Now on the outside looking in, it doesn't look bad. But when we went to make a video, this is the wire I couldn't end up using, and I'll show you what it looks like. Now, I want to reiterate, we've got our shielding gas on. We've got our wire ran, the dual shield flux core. We've got the gas on. We've got our fan is not an issue. Our metal is going to be clean. If you have the paint, the rust, the mill scale on there, clean it. And if you're a mechanic, do not use, what's it called? Brake clean. Don't use brake clean. Brake clean cleans the crap out of stuff, but it also creates nerve gas when you burn it. Use other cleaners, not freaking brake clean. In this case, I'm gonna use my dye pin cleaner to get some of that paint off so we know for a fact that that's not why we're getting the porosity in this weld. Like I said, I used this wire one time and it had great success with it. No problems. Go to use it the second time after a few months of never using it, problems. The worst part about flux core and dual shield flux core is the fact that it has that slag. So like stick welding, you're gonna have to chip and remove that slag at the end of it. But the biggest issue with that compared to like MIG welding is you can't physically see any problems with this weld until you remove that slag. Same while you're welding it. That slag is so heavy, it's hard to see anything, any problems underneath. But just a simple wire wheel will show you nothing but freaking problems, man. You'll weld, you'll put inches down and you'll be like, dang, all that's messed up. So you definitely wanna make sure everything's good and you maybe use some scrap material to make sure your machine is running properly before you start putting a bunch of metal in a groove where it's just full of absolute nasty porosity. This is what we're gonna call a combination of linear porosity as well as wormhole porosity. I hope you took some value out of this, guys. And again, please check our description in the links below. We got a lot of good values and a lot of good deals for y'all in our partner section below. I hope you took some value out of what porosity is. There's only one good way to remove that, and that's just grinding or gouging or whatever method you wanna use to get all that bad metal out so you can put some new stuff in. Just make sure before you put some new stuff in, you diagnose the problem so you're not driving yourself up a wall and going crazy. Again, thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you on the next one.
One thing that should give us some better results. Oh, spray paint. <laughs> no way. No way we don't get a pinhole. I'll be dipped. 